In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the life of Elder Cleopa, and then uh, I think I announced to you the eight types of temptations. It's uh, specifically eight ways that the devil tempts a person and fights them. Uh, fights them. Okay, and so what I'll do is after telling you a little bit about the life of Elder Cleopa, I will um, read through portions of his teaching and then just offer some commentary on it. Okay, so this is this is kind of a primer in the spiritual life in ways that you can expect temptation to come. And uh, I think you'll see from your own life when I read through this, you're going to recognize a lot of these these types of temptations. So, Elder Cleopa was born in Romania as Constantine Ilia on April tenth, nineteen twelve the fifth of ten children, and to a family of peasants. He and his two older brothers became disciples of the great elder Paisi Olaru. I mentioned a minute ago, um, Elder Cleopa is set to be glorified officially next year. Uh, Paisi Olaru, who's buried right next to him, I've, I've been to their graves, I've been to, to the monastery where they're buried, um, he is also set to be glorified next year. So this is not Paisius of Manathos, this is a different Paisia. So he and two of his brothers were disciples of Paisiolaru, who uh, really taught them to embrace the spiritual life in prayer wholeheartedly. He really uh, instructed them quite a bit to pray the Psalms. And so they used to go up into their attic, where uh, in Romania typically you store the grain that you get every year. Um, they would go into their attic and they'd pray the Psalms for hours. Sometimes the Psalter all the way through, take you multiple hours. And while they would, would do this, they would hear all this banging and other such things. And... Elder Cleopa, being the youngest, he used to look around at this, and the brothers would say, don't pay attention to that. That's just the devil trying to distract you. That's all it is. And that's what would happen. I mean, they were already so steep in prayer, the devil was trying to distract them and scare them in prayer, even at a young age. At just the age of 17, he and one of his brothers left for Tihasthia. Tihasthia today is a very large, beautiful monastery. At the time, it was just a hermitage, which means it was a small group of monks. Um, they did not have the structure of a typical communal monastery. And so he went there to, uh, to practice uh, the Jesus prayer and hesychism. Elder Cleopa was made uh, a shepherd. So he spent his days in reading and praying, and he would get so enraptured. He'd get so focused on his reading and his prayers that he would forget to eat throughout the day. He'd get to the end of the day and realize, oh, I completely forgot to eat the entire time. But because of the holiness that radiated off of him, he didn't really have to work too hard to shepherd his sheep. The sheep would remain close to him, just out of, out of the grace that overflowed from him. But he was concerned with this, this particular obedience. His concern was the monks would gather and pray together in services. And he had to miss these things because he was out in the mountains surrounding Siastria with the sheep. And so he went to his, his abbot and he, he told him, he said, I, you know, I'm concerned. I came here to pray and you know, I don't mind being the shepherd, but I never get to go to church and be with the other monks. And the abbot said, you know, when I sense the church, I look and I see all the monks and he goes, you don't know it, but I see you among them because you're, you're obedient to me. You're, you're so humbly practicing your obedience of being a shepherd that mystically I see you there as if you're there with the monks, which means you're benefiting just as much as if you were there in the services. You know, God, God still pours his grace upon you. After six years, he, had, he never actually became a monk at that point. Um, he, was, he was still uh, a novice because uh, he had to do his mandatory year of, of service in the army. So he did his, his year of service, and then he returned to the hermitage where he was taunted a monk on August 2nd, 1937, and he took the name Cleopa. He advanced so quickly in his spiritual life that he was made second in charge just five years later at the age of 30. Very, very unusual at that time to be made, uh, to be put in this, this high position, which meant that if the abbot weren't there, he was the guy in charge whenever the abbot was away on business. Three years later, he was ordained a priest, and he was made the official egumen, or abbot, of the hermitage. Again, very, very young, 33 years of age. Two years after this, the hermitage became an official monastery by the decree of the patriarch. But unfortunately, the following year, the communist securitate, which are the Romanian version of the KJB, they began seeking Elder Cleopa to arrest him because he was already becoming well-known. They didn't like spiritual guides like him uh, influencing people. And so he decided to disappear into the woods around the monastery, and he was gone for about six months living in asceticism. He, um, he described, I'll tell you a bit about that, that experience because he went back to the woods later, but he described it as a, a very harrowing and, and uh, terrifying experience being in the woods. After he returned, 30 monks, including Cleopa, were relocated by the patriarch to Slatina Monastery, where Elder Cleopa was made the abbot. There, 
He grew the community to over 80 monks. But in 1952, he and another monk named Father Arseny Papachok, a couple really good books. The life of Father Arseny Papachok is called Eternity in the Moment. Phenomenal book. First 68 pages, terribly boring. I mean, like, I, I could not get through it. And when I got through that, after that, it became one of my favorite books. And then there's a new one, a collection of his teachings that just came out this past year called Every Sigh Can Be a Prayer, which is just, I've been reading it this Lent, and it's, it's just, it's transforming me, honestly. So it's short, simple, but it's so beautiful. So Father Arseny Papachuk was a, a close companion of Elder Cleopa. So he and Elder Cleopa, they were pursued by the communists once again, so they escaped into the mountains again. And in this wilderness, Elder Cleopa spent the next two years. During these two years, he doesn't give a lot of details about it, but he said that it is one of the most frightening experiences to live in a cave in the wilderness with all the sounds at night, all the wild animals, and the demonic attacks that occurred. He says that he endured every assault of the demons who would even appear physically to him. And he said the sight of a demon for a single second, unless you've really prepared yourself, can absolutely tear you apart and destroy you. They're so horrific and they smell so awful and they sound so awful. But they, they continued to attack him or he continued to uh, work out his asceticism and uh, practice the prayer of the heart. And he became so spiritually advanced that when he returned after enduring everything, uh, by patriarchal order he returned, he was recognized as one of the great spiritual leaders of the 20th century. So he returned to Siha Sidiya Monastery by patriarchal order and he became the confessor to the entire community. In addition to confessing the community, in Romania, the monasteries tend to be very evangelical, which means that they, that they, they, um, they really work a lot on preaching to the people. And so you go to most monasteries, and, and if you don't see the monks and nuns very much, that's pretty common because they're all doing their obediences. But if you have a great elder like this in Romania, they'll sit outside of their cell and teach people. And so he would have crowds of people. And by the way, you can go on YouTube and see this. I've been to a cell, and you can, you can see videos of people sitting around his cell and him sitting outside and just teaching. And he would teach them. And he was re-educating them in the, in, the, um, in the orthodoxy that the communists had tried to snuff out. And so he'd sit outside almost daily to teach pilgrims. And he continued this work for the next 34 years until his repose. He reposed on December 2nd, 1998. So a very, very recent uh, elder. Those who visited Elder Cleopa found a man who would give long discourses on the spiritual life that were often word for word from a writing of a Holy Father even though Elder Cleopa never intentionally memorized the text. What does this mean? It means that when the grace of God inspires these great saints, it guides them in what to say. Not as, not as if they've, they've lost control of themselves, but because of the purity of their heart. They're, they're led and guided by the Holy Spirit because they've given their will over to grace. And in doing so, sometimes they say the exact same things without even realizing it. So people would go and open books and say, oh my goodness, this is, this is word for word what el the elder was just telling us. They would be shocked by this. They found that he had a very powerful gift of clairvoyance, where he would know people's names, their thoughts, and their concerns without ever having met them before or talked with them. My favorite story of this, there was an elderly woman, um, the, the monk who was with Elder Cleopa on, when, he, when he reposed. He was at his deathbed. Um, he told me this story uh, when I was in Romania. He said that there was a, a, a woman who kept telling one of her friends, you have to come meet Elder Cleopa. Like, this is, this is a sure guide in the faith. You have to meet this man. And so it was like near the end of his life, and she takes her friend to this, this monastery, Siastria, and from a distance, her friend sees Elder Cleopa. And she goes, that's the guy you want me to, that old fool? You want me to meet him? I mean, she was expecting some, like, young, glorious, you know, perfectly kept monk, and she saw this old guy in a sheepskin vest, and uh, with a cane, and, and, and was rather so shocked. And so she goes, that old fool? Well, they, they walk all the way to his cell, and Elder Cleopa to the first woman gives his blessing, and then as, as he's giving his blessing to the, the friend, he goes, yes, dear, this old fool. He knew, <laughs> he knew exactly what she had said, even though there was some distance away. First and foremost, though, Elder Cleopa was a, a man of great prayer. He taught the depths of noetic prayer to countless monks, and he continued on the... Uh, the practice of hesychism to uh, all of Romania, really, because of his teachings. He was known also for being a great catechist of orthodoxy. Again, communism had destroyed orthodox education. It snuffed it out of the schools. It had imprisoned all the great elders and teachers of noetic prayer. 
and uh, Elder Cleopa thought it was his his main role to really teach the people and re-educate them in their orthodoxy, and that's what he did. He wrote many, many works and gave constant discourses to people to instruct them in the orthodox way of life. Many saints, many other saints, had a great love and respect for Elder Cleopa to the point that many would go and visit him. He had a great relationship with Saint Sophroni. I don't think he ever met Saint Sophroni in person, but they knew each of each other because they would meet in prayer. They, they, they had an agreement. There were multiple holy figures, all saints, whether officially glorified yet or not, who would pray at the same time every night. And they'd meet and actually discourse with each other. So, so Saint Sophroni knew Elder Cleopa, even though they never met in person. Um, other ones who loved him... Um, Saint Porfirios, Saint Porfirios had a great love for Elder Cleopa, knew, knew of his reputation, and also would pray with him. Uh, figures who went and met him uh, from Serbia, Elder Thaddeus, who wrote "Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives." You can you can watch the video on YouTube of them meeting, and you can see the great love that Elder Thaddeus had for Elder Cleopa, even though they were just meeting. Um, I mean, absolutely, like two souls united when they meet each other. And another one, Saint Justin Popovich, who was like greatest theologian of the 20th century, who reposed in 1979. Saint J uh, Justin. He wanted to go to Mount Athos and become a hermit. That's what he really desired. But he decided that he would only do so if he had the blessing of Elder Cleopa, this great elder he'd heard about. So he goes to Romania and he meets Elder Cleopa and Elder Cleopa says, no, 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 the Serbian people need you. And so St. Saint, Saint Justin was obedient to this and remained in Serbia rather than going to Mount Athos. Um, if you go to Elder Cleopa's cell, they have St. Justin Popovich's hat, uh, his monastic cap. Uh, there uh, among his things. I was able to hold it. Um, I, I didn't put it on. I didn't feel, it, it didn't feel right uh, doing that. I just, I was kind of in awe because St. Justin's one of my favorite saints and I love Elder Cleopa. And, uh, being in Elder Cleopa's cell holding St. Justin's hat, I just kind of like stared at it and I went, uh, no. <laughs> and, uh, even my wife was like, uh, you should not. <laughs> so, so I didn't. Um, but uh, of course I venerated it. It was, it was a great experience. Um, so, uh, so again, many, many of these saints would go to Elder Cleopa for advice and, uh, and would be obedient to him. Uh, we have, the uh, again, the great blessing of being able to watch videos of Elder Cleopa on YouTube with English subtitles. Um, Elder Cleopa provided the middle name for my youngest child. Simeon's middle name is Cleopa. Um, and next year, as I said, Ro Romania will officially glorify uh, Elder Cleopa among, I think, like, eight or nine other great figures in uh, Romanian orthodoxy. Um, so we uh, eagerly await that day. Okay, so with that, um, let's talk about this teaching from, uh, from Elder Cleopa. This teaching was uh, written down by one of the disciples of St. Justin Popovich, who went with him to meet Elder Cleopa. And after Elder Cleopa gave them a discourse, he thought it was so beautiful, he immediately ran and uh, um, it was Bishop Athana Athanasia, um, he wrote down everything that, he, that Elder Cleopa had taught because he thought it was such a great teaching. And so what I'll do is I'll just read through this. And uh, after each one of the types of temptation, uh, I'll describe a little bit about what I think he's talking about and what this means for us practically. So this is what um, uh, Bishop Athanasia writes. The Holy Fathers say, and then in parentheses he says, this is how El Father Cleopa began to briefly describe to us his spiritual experience inherited from the Holy Fathers and personally experienced by him, which clearly confirmed his every word. The Holy Fathers say that a person on the path of salvation is tempted from the devil from eight sides, from behind, from in front, on the left, on the right, above, below, inside, and outside. So, from behind. From behind, a person is tempted when he constantly remembers his previously committed sins, so his past and evil deeds, and again brings them back to his consciousness, shakes them up, deals with them, either despairing because of them or thinking about them with voluptuousness. In other words, uh, if you think of lustful thoughts, you begin to become lustful, or you think about your past sins and fall into despair, thinking, I'm so awful, I'm so terrible. Such remembrance of what we have done in the past is a devilish temptation. So what do, what do I think he's talking about here? Shame and despair come often when we remember our own sinful past. And that shame and despair, believe it or not, does not come from humility. It comes from egoism. Why? Because we're somehow surprised by our sins. We look at our sins and we go, 
I can't believe that I'm so sinful. I can't believe that I've done such shameful things. Whereas humility would go, of course I've done shameful things. Of course I'm sinful. No surprise there. I didn't live my life in communion with Christ, and because of that, I fell into all sorts of depravity. Why am I surprised by that? What ends up happening is when we have this, this uh, shame and despair from egoism, we begin identifying falsely with our sin. What happens is we begin to look at our sin and say, this is not just what I did, this is who I am. Now, we have that option. Christ gives us free will, so we can identify more with grace and salvation and the saint who he wants us to become, or we can identify more with our sin. But in doing so, by taking that latter path, we're actually taking on a false identity. We're embracing that ourselves. So this is why you hear me say all the time, you are not your thoughts, you are not your feelings, and you are not your sin. To identify with your sin is a dangerous thing. It's to take on a false identity, which is exactly what the devil did. The devil, the angel of light, took on the identity of one who fights God as, as, a, as an angel of darkness rather than light. And that's what he's become, even though that's not God, what God intended him to be at creation. So we have to, when we recognize our past sins and they come up back in our mind, we have to say, no, this is not who I am. Especially after baptism, because baptism is taking on a new identity. So there's a lot of freedom in that. It's a lot of freedom. And you may say, yeah, but I'm afraid I'm going to fall into the same sin again. Again, humility goes, I'm probably going to fall into the same sin again. But I'm also going to define my life by the fact that I get up and I continue to struggle to overcome that sin, however long it takes. Be defined first and foremost by your struggle for virtue, not your succumbing to sin. The other big problem with remembering past sins and falling into shame and despair is that it's a failure to truly see and believe in Christ's love. We begin to somehow see that our, our sin is more powerful than Christ. That is a great blasphemy. Never view your sin as more powerful than Christ's mercy. But because of a lot of psychological things that have happened in our life, because of our history, sometimes we have a really tough time truly believing that Christ actually loves us that much and that personally. And that's something we have to work on. If you're, having, if you're struggling with that, come and talk to me, and I'll tell you kind of how we begin to build out of that. But this is why that personal relationship with Christ in prayer, praying every day, and when you pray, as I tell you, don't say your prayers, don't read your prayers, pray your prayers. And when you pray your prayers, do not pray to a distant Christ. If you pray to a distant Christ, Christ is going to continue to feel distant. But if you pray to a Christ who is near you, who loves you perfectly, who is merciful and desires your salvation more than anything, suddenly you're going to start to experience Christ like that. Pray to a Christ who is near and who loves you personally and perfectly. And that's how Christ will start to, to uh, uh, manifest himself in your life. Now, within this, humility is really necessary. The question of, should I remember my past sins, is going to be answered differently from different saints. Not because they disagree, but because they're talking about different scenarios. So if you read St. Silo on the Athenite, also one of my absolute favorite saints, he says, you should remember your past sins because it'll tell you just how easily you fall away from Christ. It'll keep your zeal for the spiritual life up. It'll remind you of how much you need Christ. The context of this, though, is that St. Siloan is talking as one who has already obtained a certain level of humility, where that memory of sin is not going to destroy you. Until you have that humility, you have to be at least humble enough to say, I'm not ready for that yet. And so at the beginning of the spiritual life, it's best that once you confess a sin, once you're baptized, be done with it. Leave it. What I recommend to people in confession is this. If a sin that you've confessed w keeps kind of dogging you, what do you do with it? Come talk to me. Because there's probably something that's unresolved there that we need to talk about. And, and sometimes it's just a psychological thing we need to work through that. But once we work through it, hopefully it'll kind of leave. Okay, so if you can't get rid of something from your past, come talk to me and we'll talk about that. But otherwise... Especially after baptism, once you've been baptized, everything before that's done. Once you confess, it's done. You've got to leave it behind you. And once you obtain that certain level of humility, then you can utilize those things and say, I need to remember how easy it is for me to fall. So you remain humble. But that takes a little while to get to. Okay, that's uh, temptations from behind. Temptations from in front. In front, a person is usually tempted through fear at the thought of the future awaiting him. What will happen to him or to the world? How long will we live? Will we have something to eat? Whether there will be wars or any serious and terrible events ahead. In general, all sorts of guesses, foresights, prophecies, and everything 
that causes us to fear the future. This is a big one today. Why? Because the news has made us believe that it's normal to constantly worry about the future. It's not from a Christian standpoint. What are you told? God can count the number of hairs in your head. He makes sure that the bird gets the worm. If he cares for that, he's going to care for you. So what do we need in this? We need to learn that that anxiety about the future is a failure to trust in the providence of God. It's a failure to trust in the providence of God. Now, trust in the providence of God does not mean that we sit back and do nothing. People come to me and they say, is it somehow unchristian to save money? No, of course it's not unchristian to save money. Now, that's not where, where our heart goes first. The, the, the first fruits of our labor, we tithe. And we worry about the, the, the poor around us. We worry about the church, obviously. We worry about all these things. But the point is, is that in seeking security, we don't get obsessed with the idea that somehow we're in full control of that. Is it wrong to save a little food? No, it's not wrong to store a little food. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're becoming obsessive about it, this is a really big problem. So one of the pieces of advice when people come to me and they, they, they often ask, like, is it wrong for me to buy a gun to protect my family? A lot of husbands will ask me this, and I'll tell them no. Like, a husband should be the protector of his family, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Of course, you have to understand what that's going to do to you psychologically. So for some men, they go and buy a gun, and guess what happens? They get more anxious. And suddenly, every time they hear a little creak in the house, they grab it and they're walking around the house as if they're John Wick, and it's ridiculous. And it's making them more paranoid. That's really unhealthy. And that says there's something wrong deep in your heart. You need to be able to have peace without it before you can have peace with it. So it's the same thing when thinking about the future. Can you prepare for the future? Yes, but do so without anxiety, without fear. Put your trust in Christ with these things. What is this cured with? Prayer and humility. Prayer and humility are what put all trust in, in Christ. And this is something we need to work on daily when we pray. If you notice anxiety about the future plaguing you, every day, give those cares over to Christ. Set them at the feet of Christ and the cross and beg Christ to help you become more trustful and get away from the things that spike the anxiety. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it in the sea. The same thing. If news is causing you to have undue anxiety, stop looking at it. Stop. I, I have a family member who used to have 24 hour news on like 24 hours <laughs> all the time. And they, they eventually one day decided just to shut it off. They didn't like what it was doing to them. And they were shocked. And they told me like after just a couple days, they said they were walking around and they forgot what it was like to live without anxiety and fear all the time. But it was gone because out of sight, out of mind. You don't think about these things. Social media will also do this to you, by the way. Social media will put a lot of thoughts. You see how other people are living and think this is how my life should be and it's not like that and therefore there's something wrong. Is that how their life really is? No, nobody puts their real life on there. You know, how many social media uh, posts do you say, like, you know, beautiful day today. Oh, unfortunately, I got a really bad fight with my husband and uh, we're on the verge of divorce. Bye! <laughs> no one does that. No one puts the bad stuff of their life on there, you know, unless they want attention for it. You know, I spilled my drink in my car, but don't worry, before cleaning it up, I made sure to take 18 pictures and put them all on social media so you could all see it and feel bad for it. It's like, it's a really odd way to live. You know, so social media, I would say just get rid of it as much as possible. And you'll notice anxiety levels go down. Okay, on the left. On the left, a person is tempted by, devil, uh, by the devil through a call to obvious sins, to such actions and deeds that are known to be sins and evil, but people, even despite this, commit them. This temptation is an open call to sin, to sin directly and consciously. Well, why in the world would we sin openly and consciously when we know that we shouldn't? Well, we have to understand that sin occurs because it's desirous. <laughs> if we didn't desire it in the first place, we wouldn't do it. As, you know, the example I think I give in the catechumen lectures is no one's going to hand you a bottle that has a skull and crossbones on it that has poison and says, want a drink? What they're going to do is they're going to lace really good Nestle chocolate chip cookies straight out of the oven with that beautiful smell with it. And they're going to say, eat this. Why? Because the initial gratification overcomes your thought that there might be something bad in this. I don't like this person who's giving it to me and the look that they give me. So this is how sin works. Sin says, I'm going to give you some gratification and that's going to fill you. That's going to complete you. You're going to be happy with that. And that joy and that completeness lasts for like two seconds. And then you go, oh, I feel miserable again. In fact, I feel worse. That's how sin works. So the devil is constantly looking at you from the left, he's saying, and saying, 
I know it didn't work out so well last time, but this time it'll work out. Look at that video that you shouldn't watch online. This time it's going to feel really good. You're going you're gonna to be you're going to be very happy after this, and then you're not. I bet next time you will. You know, but between that, he's saying despair, feel horrible about yourself, don't go to Christ because you're just too off. Like this is the, na the nature of the lies of the devil, right? Sin, embrace this thing because you're really going to feel great about this. Oh, you did it? Now you're horrible and you're awful and Christ will never love you again and your whole spiritual life is done. And then like, you finally work your way out of that pit and you go, okay, I'm back to normal. Do it again! And, and you know we're dumb, so we're like, okay. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but this is how we live the spiritual life. If it weren't desirous in the first place, and we have to recognize that. So if it weren't desirous in the first place, we would never do it. So how do you get yourself away from that desire? A, you recognize it as a deception, and B, you recognize there's something greater that you want. There's something deeper, more fulfilling, more beautiful, more real. And that more real thing works the opposite way. Initially, it's bitter rather than sweet. But in the long run, it's really sweet and completes you. And that's the nature of the spiritual life. St. Maximus Confessor talks a lot about this. He says, sin works this way. Work for comfort and pleasure, and it's going to break you and make you miserable. Or work to be broken, and then you're going to actually be complete because you're going to seek Christ in that. Why? Because he seeks a broken and contrite heart. So we have to seek that brokenness of heart, which initially is painful. Fasting, not that fun to begin with, right? Prostrations, not that fun. But the more you do it, the more you go, actually, there's something really beautiful about this. But you only learn that over time. It's the same thing as like, an example I always give is compare this to going to the gym. Who here likes to go to the gym? Okay. Did you enjoy it the first few times you went? It's like miserable. It's work. You know, it's time out of my day. If you're paying for the gym, you're losing money in it. And the first few times you do it, you do a few lifts. And you're like, this isn't so bad. And then for the next two days, you're like, I can't move my arms. It hurts because you're tearing your muscles. But over time, you go, oh, I see the gains. And I see how this is benefiting me. And overall, I feel better. No pain, no gain. Like, there's a reason that that's a saying. It's the same in the spiritual life. So we have to seek something greater. And if you can't find the motivation for that because you haven't gotten to that point to realize how beneficial it is, that's where reading the lives of the saints is really helpful. Read the life of Elder Cleopa, and you go, oh, I want to be like this. That's, that's where you'll, you'll start to yearn for something greater than the, the instant gratification you get from sin. And that's where I'll also say live the spiritual life for Christ more than for yourself. Because when you're living it for yourself, you can always make excuses. I know this would be a better option for me, but I, my heart's just not in it right now. I'll, I, I won't be doing it for the right reasons. I mean, you can come up with every excuse in the world. The devil can really twist that. But if you're saying, no, 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 I want to live this spiritual life for Christ because I love him and I want to be pleasing unto him. He, he loves me so much, I don't want to sorrow him. A lot of those things kind of fall by the wayside and a lot of those, those uh, arguments just, just fail. They never really gain any traction. But again, you have to know how much Christ loves you to begin doing that. So again, if that's an issue, we can talk about that. Okay, fourth, from the right. On the right, there is temptation from the devil in two ways. The first is when a person does good deeds, but he does them with a bad, unkind intention and purpose. This is, for example, when he does good and acts well out of love for fame, or in order to achieve praise or some position, or in order to become famous, or in order to derive some benefit from it for himself. Therefore, when he does good out of vanity or greed, this is a temptation from the right. Such performance of good deeds for a bad purpose is sinful and futile. The Holy Fathers liken such performance of good deeds, for example, fasting, almsgiving, etc., to a body without a soul. For the purpose for which the deed is performed is the soul of this deed, and the deed itself is the body. Therefore, doing good deeds for a purpose that is not according to God is, in essence, a, a temptation for the person that comes to him from the right side, that is under the guise of good. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. Essentially, you do a good deed, but you do it for the wrong reasons. And then you can stand before Christ like the Pharisee and say, I fast, I pray, I give alms, I do all these wonderful things. But you do it to fill yourself rather than to empty yourself. The second temptation on the right comes from the devil through various ghosts and visions when a person accepts the appearance of the devil in the image of God or an angel of God. This trust in devilish ghosts and this mistaking of demonic phenomena for angelic ones is what the Holy Fathers called deception and delusion. Elder Cleop experienced this, by the way, where the devil would appear in things that, in ways that appeared to be grace-filled. So, 
Essentially, this is the appearance of good when evil is at the root. This is what he's talking about. How do we cure these two, these two temptations for the right? What's well, cured by A, seeking to hide virtue, even from yourself. What, what does Christ say you should say to yourself when you fulfill the commandments and do good? I'm a useless servant. I'm only doing what I was commanded to do. Like, this is the line, and oh, great, I made it to the line. I didn't go above it, though. This is what we're all called to do. Okay? We also recognize that it's only by grace that we can do good in the first place. What am I always telling you? There's nothing we can call our own except our sin. Everything we have, our body, our soul, our good thoughts, our good will, our good actions, they all come from God. The only thing that we actually own that God did not give us is our sin. So why are we becoming proud by that? Humility also distrusts. It distrusts ourselves and our own motivation. So it questions ourselves. Did I really do that for the right reason? Well, I pray to God that it was for the right reason. If it wasn't, God forgive me. And that also works with these false visions, things that seem to be divine visitations. So if in prayer you're smelling beautiful fragrances, you may think like this is only for like this really small segment. No, I know people who, every single one of these things, like I know people who this has happened to. I know people who have seen angels, seen saints, heard voices, not schizophrenic, like heard voices of saints giving them instruction, smelled beautiful fragrances, various things. The best thing to do in those situations is say, Lord, this can't be real because I'm not worthy of such a visitation. So this must be false. And the Father say, in that way, you benefit no matter what. Whether it was real or false, Christ sees the humility and you're rewarded for that. So we should always check our motivations. We should always check our assumptions. And who do we check this with? A spiritual father. So if you do have dreams, visions, anything that happens, or you're questioning your own motivations, come and talk to me. And we'll talk, I'll ask you some questions. And in some cases, I'll say, Yes, this is what I think is happening. In a lot of cases, they'll say, I'm not sure. So it's best just to distrust it. That's the sure way. Okay. Fifth, from above. A person is tempted by the devil from above when he can, but does not perform good deeds and holy virtues because of laziness. When he knows and can put more effort and labor into achievements, virtues and good deeds, but does not do this because he is lazy or, overlook, or, or looks for excuses for his laziness. So that in essence, he spiritually rejects them, does much less than he could in reality. Okay? This is a very big temptation for our age that is obsessed with comfort. Being tough on ourself with spiritual expectations is a good thing. Not in the way that you hammer yourself into depression, but to say, you know what? Just because I don't feel like this, I'm not going to be driven by my feelings anymore. To be led by our feelings is always deception. It's never good for us. Don't be led by feelings, okay? Have high expectations. Now, don't have high expectations in an all-or-nothing approach. That's dangerous too. I either do it all or I do nothing. Rather say, no, no, I want to shoot for this so that if I fail, I fail here rather than fail here. So, I'm going to... Now, you have to do this within reason, which again, you need to talk to a spiritual father because if you come to me and say... I've decided I'm going to be tough on myself and pray for eight hours a day. How much are you praying right now? Ten minutes? Why don't we go for 15 minutes first? <laughs> and then maybe we can talk about increasing that a little by little. So we need to be realistic and humble about this. But we should be tough, which means that we're like, when we're too tired to pray at night, we say, I can't do my whole prayer roll. Okay, but can you do five minutes of it? Rather than just saying, I'm just not going to do nothing. Um, we need to see difficulties in the proper way. Spiritually, how should we see difficulties? Not as obstacles that are making life too tough on us, but rather as opportunities. Because when the spiritual life is going well and everything's easy, then praying before Christ is it's all well and good. But how much benefit is there really? Whereas when you sit there and go, man, I really don't want to pray, but I love Christ too much. I'm going to do it anyway. Despite the fact that I'm exhausted, I'm going to get less sleep, my body's sore, I can't focus. But out of love for Christ, I want to do this. That's true love. Look at this in any human relationship. You know, when my wife and I are getting along really well, and I buy her chocolate dipped biscotti or warm socks, those are two favorite things in the world, by the way. It's true. I, I gave her the engagement ring. She was like, give that to me. And I gave her warm socks, and she's like, oh, you're great. I love you. Like, she loves those things. So that's great when things are going well. But if we're arguing, and I, I go to her and I say, you know what, my love, like, I, we really disagree on this, and I'm still pretty upset, but I want you to know how much I do love you, and so I bought you these things. That's really meaningful. Because it says my love for you is going to overcome whatever disagreement we have. 
Sometimes we disagree with Christ. Christ, you didn't give me the energy and the time today to pray to you the way... No, Christ, I love you. Or, I want to have love for you, and I know the only way to do that is to work through this, so I'm not going to be led by my feelings. And this difficulty is an opportunity for me to prove how much I love you. So spiritually dry periods are necessary. Expect to have dry periods in the spiritual life, and when that happens, say, glory to God, you give me an opportunity to really grow and prove how much I love you. And that means that it's, it's really necessary to find sources of true zeal. You have to find ways to really give yourself drive at those, that moment. What do I recommend for that? You, I know you've heard this a billion times. Write a spiritual message to yourself. Write yourself reminders that give you drive. So you have it in your back pocket and you can pull it out and say, man, I'm just not feeling it today. I don't want to do this. Read it. Oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. These are the reminders I needed because we're creatures of habit. We fall away really easily. Okay, six, temptation of a person from below. And he says, and to better explain this to us, Elder Cleopa, each time he showed with his hands from which side this or that temptation comes, and then briefly repeated the side the temptation he described. So from below, also occurs in two ways. The first is when a person takes on greater feats that exceed his own strength and strains himself recklessly. This happens, for example, when someone is sick but also imposes a fast on himself, and this fast is beyond his strength. Or in general, when he overdoes it in any feats that are beyond his spiritual and physical strength. Such persistence is lack of humility and unreasonable arrogance. Another temptation from below occurs when a person strives to learn the secrets of the Holy Scriptures, and in general, the secrets of God, but does this not according to his spiritual age. That is, when he himself wants to penetrate into the mysteries of God and the Holy Scriptures among the saints and in the world and in life in general, explains them and then teaches these mysteries to other people while he himself has not grown up spiritually. I will tell you this has happened with catechumens in the past who I've told them this is not your job to teach others. Those who listened rescued themselves from a deep peril. Those who didn't are no longer orthodox. They apostatized very soon after baptism. It's very sad. Again, those are the things that keep me up at night. It's a sad thing. The Holy Fathers say that such a person wants to chew a bone with his milk teeth. St. Gregory of Nyssa speaks about this in the work The Life of Moses. God, he says, therefore commanded the Israelites, as imperfect, that they should eat only the meat of the Passover lamb, which is milk for their teeth, and moreover, eat it with bitter herbs, and not break or eat the bones of the lamb, but burn them in the fire. This means that we need to interpret from the Holy Scriptures and in general in our faith in God only those mysteries that correspond to our spiritual age and eat them or assimilate them into our life with a bitter potion, that is, with everything that life brings us, with sufferings and sorrows. And the great and lofty, respectively deep secrets of the Holy Scriptures and divine science and divine providence like some hard bones, which cannot be chewed by milk teeth. They only yield to fire. That is, they become understandable only in a mature spiritual age, in souls experienced and experienced in the grace-filled divine fire. This is, this is really, really important. It's such good work. I mean, such good, a good word from Elder Cleopa. Be cautious. If you're reading the scriptures, do you know what you do when you can't understand something? Move past it. Keep going. Keep reading. Is it okay to look up from the Holy Father some explanation of it? Yes. But to understand it here and to understand it here are very different things. So don't get too locked up in those things. You know, it's, it's, when people do that, my first question to them is, the commandments you do understand, are you fulfilling all of them? And of course the answer is no. Well, then why are you worried about commandments? Why, why are you trying to add to them? <laughs> if God hasn't revealed to you what this commandment really is and what this calls you to, worry about the stuff that you know and that you understand. Try to fulfill those and then the other things will be made understandable to you. And that's what happens as you grow in the spiritual life. In both of those cases that he just mentioned, guidance from a spiritual father is very necessary. Both come from pride. Pride will cause you to misinterpret things and to, to fall into these temptations from below. Um, adhere to the basics first and make those basics consistent over a long period of time, which again is why I say don't go finding deep books of theology and trying to read those. You're intellectualizing the faith, but you haven't learned the basics yet. And I just, uh, you know, after doing the Roots of Orthodoxy interview, and I kind of, I, kind of I, I thought it was pretty gentle, actually. I went after some of the internet warriors. I got, I got some pretty angry emails already. <laughs> How dare you? Oh, I can't believe you say this to us. Do you think that we should... 
Should we be bold in the spiritual life? Of course you should be bold. But be bold with humility. Don't be bold with arrogance and pride. And know your spiritual age, which means first focus on yourself. There's a time for boldness. There's a time to lock your door, be alone at your icon corner, and learn the basics. And that's the majority of the first 20 years of your spiritual life. So that's all, that's all there is to it. And this is why I always say, focus mostly on the lives of the saints. Why? They help reveal what the gospel imprinted upon the heart looks like. They show you how to live the gospel, which is much more important than understanding intellectually the gospel. And always, 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 always see yourself as a beginner. Getting blessings, or better, getting instructions on increasing our struggle is necessary. In other words, if you want to grow your spiritual life and struggle more deeply, get... I say, I say it's better to get instruction rather than blessings because some people come to me and they say, I want a blessing to do X. It's better to say, Father, I want to grow in this. How should I do that? It's, it's hum more humble because you're not directing yourself at all. Because I, I, I believe in freedom in the spiritual life, so guess what I'm going to say? Go for it. Have fun. But I'm going to warn you, this is probably what's going to happen. And I can't tell you how many times people... And by the way, this is not because I'm some wise guru. It's because I've made those stupid mistakes. <laughs> I know from experience. I've done the dumb things. And I know that when things don't work out, and so that's why it's funny when people go, how'd you guess that? Because I did that 18 times <laughs> you know, before I picked up on the lesson. Okay? The foundation of everything also, prayer. prayer is the fit. So if you don't have a good prayer life, why are you worried about deep theology? Worry about deepening your prayer life first. Okay, number seven. Sorry, this is going longer than I wanted, but this is such good stuff. I mean, good stuff, yes? Yeah, yeah. Like this is like, I, I love this so much. Okay, temptations from within. I think you know where this is going. A person is tempted by what is in his heart and what comes from this heart and tempts him. The Lord Jesus Christ clearly said here that from within, from the human heart, comes sinful and unclean thoughts and desires or lusts. See Matthew 15, 19. By which a person is tempted. A person is tempted not only by the devil, but also by human evil intentions and by evil habits, lust, evil desires, human inner, inner love of self, emanating from his unclean heart. What does this mean? You need to learn about yourself in the spiritual life. And that takes a long time to really get to know yourself and see what's inside of yourself. For those who have been Orthodox for a while, have you come across experiences where you realize that there's a darkness in your heart that you didn't even realize was there and you are surprised by it? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. There are, there are things where I'm like, I had no idea that was in there. That's good when that happens. We don't go into despair. We go, oh, Christ has revealed something. He's revealed a way that I can love him more. That it's something that I need to work on. So it takes a long time. And what helps with that? Frequent confession. And why does frequent confession help? Because a lot of times we're dealing with things that we think is not a big deal until we've confessed it for the 18th time in a row. And we go, huh, this is more deeply rooted than I realized. I thought this wasn't a big deal. And yet for 18 confessions now, I haven't been able to get rid of it. Maybe I need to be, pay more attention to this. Whereas if we're not confessing, it's in the back of our mind and we don't really think it's serious and we never actually have to confront it. Finding deep passions and fighting for virtue. This is the key. Don't fight against the passion. Fight for the corresponding virtue. So when you find a passion, notice that that is a distortion, as we said, of the proper virtue. I'm a glutton. I need to work on fasting. I'm lustful. I need to work on temperance and chastity. I'm angry all the time. I need to work on inner peace. Work on those things. And know that that takes struggle. It takes struggle. So don't think that because you've discovered it, you're going to pray about it, it's going to be done. No, no, no. Christ is going to let you struggle. Why? Because through the struggle, you find your salvation. Right? Those who endure to the end will be saved. Through many tribulations, we will enter the kingdom of heaven. Both of those are from the scriptures. So we have to struggle. And why? Because as I've taught to you many times, if it's all just a matter of, I'm going to pray to God and he's just going to take it from me and it's done. Where's the crown in that? How am I going to be crowned with glory in the age to come? Whereas if I'm constantly struggling, every time I fall and humble myself or every time I'm victorious over that temptation, you get another crown, another one. Because Christ wants you to go into heaven with many, many jewels and crowns stored up so you can have a beautiful mansion. Not literal mansion, of course. <laughs> this is spiritual glories. This is, this is scriptural language. Okay, and finally, the eighth gate of the devil's temptation opens for a person from the outside through external things and reasons. That is through everything that enters a person from the outside through his feelings, which are the window of the soul. 
Feelings are the windows of the soul. These external things are not evil in themselves, but through them, through the senses, a person can also be tempted and led into evil and sin. So feelings doesn't just mean emotional feelings. He means physical, audio, audible things, visual things. We, we come into contact with things through the senses. And so what's the first recommendation there? Well, if you can just stay away from those things, then just stay away from them. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to pridefully say, you know what, I really want to minister to the ladies at the dancing club down the street. And I'm going to go there. Why would you put yourself in that temptation? But let's, let's talk about a more basic, like, and a more difficult, honestly, this is because this is a more real thing for us. What about the temptation of friends who are leading you astray? You may, as part of your spiritual life, have to say goodbye to longtime friends. It may be necessary. That's one of those sacrifices. A lot of people go into, the, into this, this distortion, this, this lie, where they believe, well, I'll be the good influence on them. You'll find pretty quickly whether that's going to work or not. And sometimes you have to say goodbye. Sometimes you have to say goodbye to family members. It's tough. But this is what Christ calls us to. I'm not, I'm not encouraging you in that. I'm not saying just, just do away with all those things right away. That has to be done in a timely manner, again, with advice. It's a good way to do it. And I'm not saying you just throw them away because sometimes a simple conversation is enough. I've had friends where I just said, you know what? I've left that part of my life behind. I don't really want to be involved in this stuff. I don't want to hear these conversations. I don't want to hear these types of jokes anymore. And they can be really respectful of that. Now, you don't do that arrogantly and pridefully. And sometimes it just takes being quiet. And they go, wow, they're not participating in this anymore. And they learn. But some people don't. Some people don't. I had, I had a, a spiritual child years ago who had friends who, because he came from an atheist background, they used to make fun of holy things. And he would become quiet about these things because he was entering the Orthodox Church. And he said, they started to notice that, and they started to kind of mock him and make fun of him. And he said, you know what? These things are actually sacred to me now, and I just, I don't feel like making fun of them, and I don't feel comfortable around it. You know, and so he goes, if you guys want, you know, if you guys are going to, it's fine, but I'm just going to step away every time you do. A couple of his friends respected that. A couple did not. He said goodbye to them. He said goodbye. So these are the sacrifices we make. This also means media and social media. We already talked about that. Staying away from those. Social media is full of horrible temptations. You have to know how these things uh, uh, pull you and drive you. And of course, they, social media companies, they don't care. Right? They don't, they don't care that they're tempting you with these things because it's a dopamine hit. And so they drive those things despite the fact that you can click off of those things, you know, report, you know, ads that you think are, are explicit. You can even do all you want. They're going to keep bringing them to you. So staying away from these things. This also means, by the way, not engaging with debates or seeking to correct others. Why? Because when you engage in debates, you end up filling yourself with that egoism and anger and bitterness. That's why it's better to be very humble and just step away when you need to. Just be quiet when you need to. Um, the... Uh, woman who was just glorified this last year, um, Mother Gavrilia, or Gabriella, it depends on the translation. There's a story of her on, when she was on a bus and somebody started blaspheming the Theotokos, making fun. And she just didn't say a word. She just very quietly, at the next stop, she got up, walked off the bus and walked away. Well, the guy realized what had happened and he ran after her and profusely apologized. It's a very humble way to deal with it. She didn't say a word. She just, in her, in her thoughts, she prayed, got up and walked off. Sometimes we need to do that. Okay, so these are the eight ways of tempting every person, regardless of whether the person is in the world or in solitude. Again, this is Elder Cleopas' words. And then in, in uh, parentheses, Bishop Athanasia says, having finished listing all the eight ways of tempting a person, Elder Cleopa briefly repeated them and then attached to them the ways and means of combating all of the temptations. So there are ways to combat all of them at the same time. And this is what he says. Against all these temptations, from behind, in front, from the left, from the right, from above, from below, from the inside, from the outside, you need to fight with sobriety. That is, attention, caution, and wakefulness of the soul and body, wakefulness and vigilance of the spirit, sobriety and prudence, attention to one's thoughts and actions, or, in a word, reasoning. And on the other hand, by constant prayerful invocation of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, through unceasing prayer. In parentheses, to this Father Petronius added in Greek, prosochi ke prosevchi, 
as the Holy Fathers say, that is, with attention and prayer. In other words, the elder added, the Holy Fathers say that the struggle against all temptations and passions is as follows. To keep your mind and your whole soul and body from temptations is our work and feat from our human side. And on the other side, on the divine side, one must continually call upon the Almighty Lord Jesus Christ for help in prayer. And this is the incessant and main hesychistic prayer called the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. So I know he says two things, but I, I really divided this into three things, and this is what I'll conclude with. He says there are three things that are absolutely necessary. One's kind of inherent to that. Number one, the one that's inherent, distrust of oneself. Don't believe that you have it all figured out. Believe that you are always being tempted, always being led astray, that you need guidance from the Holy Fathers and from your priest. Number two, constant repentance and looking inward with sobriety. Finding that royal middle path, not going too far one way to one extreme of laziness or the other extreme of going beyond your means. Finding that royal middle path and being in constant repentance and looking inward, not around at other people. These are our efforts. And then what do we really need? We need grace. And that, why, that, that means dedicated, constant prayer. A prayer life. Not moments of prayer, but a prayer life. If we're doing those things, all eight of those temptations will be shut down little by little. Each one has its specifics, but overall that's what we need. Distrust of oneself, constant repentance with sobriety. Find that royal middle path and constant prayer begging grace to aid us. And these are the eight temptations from Elder Cleopa. Any questions to end out? I'm sorry that went, that went way longer than I wanted, but it's just like such good stuff. Like I could have broken that up to two or three lectures, but it's just like I was really excited to give this one because I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time. Questions? Comments? Disagreements? Angry condemnations. Great. Angry condemnation. <laughs> <laughs> Try to frame it as being angry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, Dr. Dean was mentioning boldness and faith and proclaiming truth, but also you were saying on the other side of things, being quiet and doing your short prayer corner. Mm -hmm. And the lady that got off the bus is the same thing. Yep. Um, knowing when is right to listen to Dr. Dini and when to listen yeah. to you. This is my combination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess that's my question. Is that when do you know when it's right and when do you know when to, yeah, when to be more humble and not say anything? Is, is it the mamas and the papas who sing uh, turn, turn, turn? Yeah. For every season birds. turn. Is it the birds? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's the birds. Thank you. Do you, know what, you know what that, do you know what that song is? Basically, yes. It's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's scripture. It's scripture. So that's my answer, actually, is to listen to that song, and there you go. Um, <laughs> no, my, my, my answer is that there's, there's, there's a time and a season for everything. And so you need to know, based on the situation, whether it's worthwhile saying something or not. And, and this relies on, there's two things you have to look at. One, will the people be receptive? Now, sometimes when they're not receptive, it's still important to say it because you need to plant seeds. But is this, is this a, a situation in which there will be any reception or any soil in which I can plant a seed whatsoever. Without my, it's not my job to correct people, but rather to just, just set some things aright and say, with boldness, I need to declare the truth here. And number two, can I do so with humility? It's really important. If you have true humility, you have utter peace within, within you while you do that. Most of us don't. You know, if you find yourself getting nervous or more, if you find yourself getting angry, probably not a good time to say something. So we have to ask those two questions. Is this a situation, a situation in which the person can hear it and I can do this with other humility and love for that person and offer the correction in those terms? In those times, yes, we should be bold. And I, that was the beginning of her lecture. Right? That's the part I've listened to so far. And my goodness, she's right. We need to be bold in this culture and stop being so scared to say the truth when the whole culture is yelling lies at us. We need to be able to do that. But you need to be able to do it in the right way. Because if you speak the truth in the wrong way, with anger, with arrogance, with pride, with bitterness... How many people does that really transform? No, that's why people say, well, your side is the bigoted, hateful side. You know, that's not true. But at the same time, I look at that and go, I can see why you, why you think that, because some of the loudest voices are angry and bitter and arrogant. And they've ruined it. <laughs> they've, they've, they've ruined the side of love to make it look like it is the side of arrogance and, and condemnation. That's not. That's not. So we need to be able to do it with love. And that's where boldness is done rightly. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. Again, forgive me for going so long, but uh, 
but I, I, I pray that this was beneficial to you as, as you know, preparing this was for me. So may God bless and keep you, especially through the prayers of Elder Cleopa of Romania.